Amen. If you weren't here last Wednesday night, we are just getting started in a new teaching series on end time prophecy. And we'll be in this series. Um, we were in it last week, tonight, and then also the two next two following Wednesdays as well. Last week we began by talking about the coming trial that we are facing and will be facing as Christians, the trial that's already here in one sense, but in another it will be coming to each of uh, our lives individually in the very near future. And the, the Word of God is the subject that's on trial in our world right now as we speak. And one day very soon, if it hasn't already been, the Word of God will be on trial in your own personal life as well. And you need to be aware of that. Your belief in and your understanding of and where it is that you take your stand as it pertains to the Word of God will be on trial. There's a lot of madness in our world right now. We've been pretty protected here in the Midwestern world of the United States, but on the coast of our nation and outward and at high levels of the governments of our world, flowing down even to lower levels, some cases, and from the top of the media uh, of our world and so much of the education system of our world, there is great madness and confusion right now. Everyone is confused in our world. Fundamental definitions are past the point of even being questioned or up for debate. They have now moved into the category of just simply being offensive. They're, being, they're considered offensive. It seems that the most elementary truths that have guided humanity for generations are now being discarded, causing the world around us to be flipped completely upside down. And that is exactly what's going to happen. That is exactly what's going to happen. An upside-down society is exactly what's up ahead, whether it's in our lifetime, looks like that, but who knows, or in a future generation. An upside-down society is exactly what's up ahead. Isaiah said they will say that right is wrong, and that wrong is what's right. The title of our lesson for tonight is The Coming Trouble. The coming trouble. Last week it was the coming trial. Now we're talking about the coming trouble. And this will be a two-part lesson of this uh, four-sermon series. Because tonight we're going to look a little closer at the trouble that lies up ahead. But next week we'll take an even closer look, as if with a magnifying glass. And so we'll take two weeks to closely look at the coming trouble. And by the way, the fourth sermon will be the coming triumph. Because we know, as Bible students, how this all ends. Amen. Amen. And we were just singing about it. That day is coming when the whole world will know that he is God. Everyone will know that he is king. There will be a revelation, a revealing of Jesus that he is the Christ. But before we get to that brightness of his coming, there is a chapter of human history that is going to be darker than anything we've ever experienced. The world around us really is growing darker, which will lead to a great trouble up ahead for everyone. Really for everyone. And one thing that we're going to discover as we spend this week and next week looking at the time period known as the final seven years or uh, Daniel's 70th week as it's often referred to, and then more specifically the final three and a half years of this age that we're living in, which is known as the Great Tribulation, the final three and a half years, it's known as the Great Tribulation, we're going to notice that this will be a, a very difficult time for those who seek to obey the God of the Bible, but it's also going to be a very difficult time for those who don't. And a lot of people miss that. We think of the persecution that's coming to the church at uh, so this, this point in time, and we think of the hardship, and we read of you know, the attack of the Antichrist, the attack of the governmental systems, and so on and so forth, but uh, it's pretty clear in Scripture that this is not an easy time, really, for anyone. It may surprise some to hear that, but the final chapter of this age is a chapter where God is put aside, number one, where man follows the desires of their own heart, and where Satan is permitted to lead. And what we'll find out is that if that is the formula, it makes things miserable for everyone. 
it makes things miserable for everyone. If we put the creator aside, we follow our own desires of our heart, and Satan has an opportunity to step on the scene and begin to lead, it's going to make things miserable for everyone, but it has to happen. One of the reasons that it has to happen is because there is a beginning. It's because there was a beginning. There is a beginning to the story of man and the idea of time itself. And so there is this gift of eternity, right? This gift of eternal life that's floating out there that Jesus offers us through his sacrifice on the cross. Well, to be able to step from time into eternity, time has to have a conclusion to it. And the reason things are getting worse and growing darker is because the end is going to be very similar to the beginning. Here we go again. It's Wednesday night, and I'm, in, I'm looking at Genesis again. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. What does it say? In the what? In the beginning. There's a start. There's a start point. Now, God existed before this beginning. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's eternal. But in the beginning, God created this, this world, the heavens and the earth. Look at what it says in the beginning. Verse 2, the earth was without form and void. That means it was an empty wasteland. And darkness, everybody say darkness, was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3, then God said, let there be light. Let there be illumination. And there was light. God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. There's a clear contrast, a separation between light and darkness. Verse 5, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the very first day. Remembering how time on earth began is very important when understanding how time on earth will conclude. In the beginning, there was darkness. In the end, there will be darkness. In that darkness, the Lord showed up as a shining light and brought visible separation between the light and the darkness. And that separation produced the dawning of a new day, the first day. In the darkness of the end of the age, Jesus will return as a shining light who will flash like the lightning flashes from the east to the west. And the day of the Lord will end this age and begin a new age that will ultimately usher us into eternity outside of time. So just as the contrast between light and darkness were seen in the beginning, so it will be in the conclusion or in the end of this age. And as we talked about last week, the reason for the ever-increasing darkness of today is because of the attack on the thing that brings light. Because there's an attack on the thing that brings light. Psalm 119, 105, the psalmist said, Your word, Lord, your word, your scriptures, your spoken word, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This tells us that the word of God is our light. It gives illumination to man so we know the right path that we are to travel on. So we know what is right. When the word of God then later on became flesh in the man Christ Jesus, he was then the light of the world. John chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, it says, That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Make no mistake about it, this world is becoming darker because the true source of light, the word of God, both written and in the person of Jesus Christ, are under attack. Is under attack. And if you choose the path that's void of light, Darkness will overtake your soul. Your thoughts will become darkened. Your emotions will become darkened. The way you process, the way you think, the decisions you make, the outbursts of your emotions will become darkened. So the word of God is under attack. The person of Jesus Christ is under attack, and that's what provides illumination. Not only that, but the word of God is actually the thing that holds the universe together. The word of God holds the universe together. Colossians 1.17, talking about Jesus Christ and him being the word and him being preeminent over all creation. It says, he is before all things and by him all things consist. Consist. They, they're held together by him. It says more clearly in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, 
Jesus being the brightness of his glory, of the glory of God and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. So think about it now. The word of God brings light to the, to the universe, and the word of God is, the, is what holds the universe together. If you attack it, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to see darkness and chaos. And that is the trouble that lies up ahead. As we discovered last week, in the outside world, the outside world has turned against the word of God and the apostasy against the word of God from within the church. This great deception, this this radical turning away from the sharpness of truth from within the church is already happening and it is going to intensify. And so... As this falling away from truth continues to escalate, what kind of problems, what kind of trouble are we going to see in our world? Well, the Apostle John actually saw a vision of what's to come as a result of this turning away from truth. He wrote a book at the end of your Bible called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is a very misunderstood book in the Bible. There are a lot of people who call it Revelations, probably heard that many times, revelations. It's not called revelations. There's actually only one revelation in the book. And the word revelation is the Greek word apocalypsis, which means to be revealed, to appear, to to be seen. There are many visions in this book, but they all point to one ultimate supreme revelation. And that revelation will be the fact that the entire world will soon find out that Jesus is the ruler of the universe. That's the one supreme revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. But people misunderstand that book, that we have people who are extremely obsessed with that book, and they see things into some of these visions that maybe aren't there. Um, And then we have some people who think it's a waste of time, and they say, don't even touch it. The truth of the matter is the book is in the Bible. So number one, it's not a waste of time. Number two, I don't know if you know this or not, but about 26% or so, a quarter of the Bible is prophecy. And so if we're going to throw out prophecy and say, well, that's just irrelevant to me and I don't need to read that and I don't need to seek for any kind of understanding um, and that's, you know, really there's nothing to gain there, then you can throw a quarter of your Bible out, which I would recommend not doing. The point of the book, known as the revelation of Jesus Christ, is to inform us what it will look like leading up to the return of Jesus Christ our Savior. Jesus gave John a very special vision of future events. And just an interesting side note, as we're talking about heading into the final days, and last week we concluded with the reality that if we want to endure as the saints of God and we want to um, know what's going on without reading you know, too much into headlines or anything like that, we need to stay close to Jesus. We stay close to the shepherd, we'll hear his voice, and he'll guide us. Amen? Just a side note, I think it's interesting that the two people in the Bible who received the most detailed visions of the last days were both called the beloved of God. John the beloved and Daniel, who's also called the beloved of God. What does this tell us? If you want insights into secret things pertaining to God's master plan, fall in love with the Lord. Fall in love with the Lord. Just a side note. But the Lord gave this amazing vision to John, revealing to him what will happen to the world when the great falling away from truth takes place. And what John sees is a glimpse into the spirit realm and then how spiritual movement will impact the natural realm. And the way these spiritual activations are are shown to John. He gets a glimpse into the spirit and he sees how these spiritual activations are going to manifest or impact the, the natural realm. The way that he sees it is through three different sequencing timelines. Um, you have timeline A, which is the opening of seven seals. You have timeline B, which is the blowing of seven trumpets. And then you have timeline C, which is the pouring out of seven bowls. So you have seals, trumpets, and bowls. Say that with me. Seals, trumpets, and bowls. These are showing John, who is going to write to the church so that we can see with him, what's happening in the spirit realm during the final chapter of this age. 
Now, one thing that's important to understand when studying the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ is that these three timelines, seals, trumpets, and bowls, have different starting places, but they have the same end point. They come to the same ending. They're really not one long timeline. It's not like the first seven seals, then the next seven trumpets, and then the next seven bowls. They're really three separate planes that all end at the same spot. They start in different places, but they all end in the same spot. And that ending spot is the revelation or the return of Jesus Christ. They all end in the same spot. Let me demonstrate that to you. If you look at the last two seals of the seven seals, you'll see that they are the return of Jesus Christ in the last two seals. If you look at the last trumpet in the seven trumpets, you'll see that this is also the return of Jesus Christ. Well, these aren't two separate returns. It's sequences of seven different events that will lead to the, the return of Jesus Christ. And if you look at the last bowl of the seven bowls, you'll see that that too is the return of Jesus Christ. So these seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls are not 21 sequential, you know, uh, straight sequential events that happen leading to the return of Jesus. They are actually seven events that lead to the return of Jesus just on three different planes. Does that make sense? It's kind of like how we have four Gospels detailing us a full picture of who Jesus Christ is. They work together to paint the same conclusion for us. Okay? Let me give you the quick overview of these events now, and then maybe we'll expound a little bit more on them next week. But here they are. Starting with the seven seals. This will be found in Revelation chapter 6. I'm not going to read the scriptures, but I'm just going to go through them. First of all, when I say seals, I'm not talking about the sea creature. Okay? (laughs) We're talking about wax seals on a scroll. John gets a vision of a scroll, and it's actually the title deed to the earth. It's who owns the earth, who has permission to to bring a conclusion to everything that happens in the heavens and the earth. And he's he's seeing it, and he's kind of uh, distraught and kind of weeping because no one is worthy to take this scroll and to begin to open it to bring about the conclusion of the heavens and the earth as we know it until the Lamb comes forward. Jesus Christ comes forward, and he takes the scroll, and he begins to open these seals. Um, As these seals open, it releases something in the spirit that manifests in the natural, each seal. So he pops the first seal off or pulls the first seal off, and it releases a worldwide conqueror, a worldwide conqueror, symbolized by a white horse and a rider who carries a bow, but no arrows. Arrows, excuse me. This is most likely symbolizing a conqueror who comes in and conquers the world peacefully. He has a bow. He looks like he, he could go to war, but he has no arrows. He's not actually killing. But he has a crown on his head, and he's riding a white horse, symbolizing him conquering, taking territory, but probably doing it peacefully. And this is most likely the uh, beginning of the Antichrist stepping on the world stage. Then the second seal is opened, and a spirit of war is released upon the earth. Then the third seal is opened, and a spirit of famine is released. Impossible prices on food, causing a major food shortage, a major imbalance. Uh, Then the fourth seal is opened, and great death is permitted to occur on the earth, like has never been seen before. Then the fifth seal is opened, and we understand here that many will die a martyr's death for their faith in the Lord. Then the sixth seal is opened, getting closer to the end. And here we see that there is a major disruption in the heavens, where where the sun is darkened, the moon is turned to blood red, and all the wicked... All the ungodly, all those who follow the Antichrist, hide themselves as Jesus returns. And then the seventh seal opens, and it describes the fact that there will be a half an hour of silence in heaven as Jesus returns to the earth. Most likely in awe of his uh, kingship returning to the earth. These are seven seals that all conclude, again, with the revelation of Jesus Christ. These are things that will happen as we approach the end. 
So that's one timeline, timeline A. Now timeline B, you have seven trumpets. Every time John, John gets this vision of these angels, each with a trumpet, there's seven of them, and every time they blow the trumpet, they sound the trumpet, it again releases something in the spirit that manifests in the natural. The first trumpet is sounded, and the Bible says that a third of the green grass in the trees are burned up. The second trumpet is sounded, and a third of the sea, and the sea creatures, and the ships in the sea are destroyed. The third trumpet is sounded, and a third of the rivers and springs of water are destroyed. Remember how we read in Genesis 1-2 that the earth was void, it was an empty wasteland, it was desolate. We're returning to that. A third of the grass, a third of the seas, a third of the rivers. Then the fourth trumpet is sounded. Now get this, this is where... Timeline A and timeline B seem to parallel each other. The fourth trumpet is sounded and the sun and the moon are darkened. That's the same as the sixth seal. Then the fifth trumpet is sounded and all the wicked will be tormented by demons who are released from the bottomless pit. Then the sixth trumpet is sounded and four angels are released from near the Euphrates River and they will kill one-third of mankind. Again, the wicked... The ungodly, so this is where it parallels timeline A, those who have not repented of their sins. Then the seventh trumpet, the last trump, sounds. Take a guess what it is. It's the return of Jesus Christ. The seventh, sixth and seventh seal, seventh trumpet, all signifying the return of Jesus Christ. An important side note is that the final two seals and the final three trumpets and all seven bowls that I'm about to read or explain to you, are judgments that are the wrath of God. They are the wrath of God on the wicked, on the ungodly. And we'll see that in more detail next week. But these are things that are being released by God to punish those who are not his, those who are following the Antichrist. Okay? All seven of these bowls I'm about to describe, if you read them, do not touch those who have the seal of God upon their life. The wrath of God that's poured out through these, through the final two seals, three trumpets, and all the bowls, do not touch those who have the seal of God on their life. Well, what's the seal of God? Because we kind of need that, right? I'd like to have that as the, as the wrath of God is being poured out. What's the seal of God? Paul says, Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14, he says, In Jesus, in him, you also trusted, <clears throat> after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with what? The Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Here's another aspect to the seal. 2 Timothy chapter 2.19, Paul said, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Having the seal of God means that you have the name of Jesus Christ on your life. How do you do that? By being water baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone who names the name of Christ. Having the seal of God means that you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit of promise. And having the seal of God means that you depart from iniquity. That you're turning away from sin. You want to be sealed by God? That's what it means to be sealed by God. And the wrath of God is not poured out on those who have the seal of God. Because they belong to him. This is one of the reasons that I'm a part of this church. I didn't grow up in this church, but God led my family to this church, and I'm a part of this church because of the doctrines that we teach, the core doctrines we teach. And this is not a plug for, for anyone to become a member or anything. I'm just telling you the facts. The core doctrines we teach is, number one, Jesus Christ is God Almighty. I believe that 100%. Number two, we believe to be born again, to have a new birth experience where you are water baptized with the name of Jesus Christ, spoken over your life, and that you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So that the Spirit of God that overtakes this vessel erupts out of your mouth, speaking in a language where you don't have control over it. The third core doctrine that we believe in is the doctrine of holiness. 
that we need to continue on pursuing uh, abstinence from iniquity, turning away from our, our old ways, departing from iniquity. Well, that is exactly what the seal of God is. And these judgments, the final two seals, the final three trumpets, and all seven bowls will not harm those who have the seal of God on them. This is so important to understand. Just like how the signs and seals of the Old Testament, that being faith and circumcision and lamb's blood and and other things, protected the Israelites from the ten plagues that were poured out on Egypt, so we will be protected from these plagues that come in the last days. We must understand that. Satan is going to attack us, but God would never attack his faithful. And so we come to these seven bowls. The seven bowls, these are very shallow dishes that are poured out on the earth by angels, and they happen very quickly. Most likely, they're at the end of what's known as the Great Tribulation, as the wrath of God begins to be poured out on the ungodly. They're happening very, very quickly. In the first bowl that's poured out, it says when it's poured out that a foul and loathsome sore will come upon the wicked. Again, this is the wrath of God, and it's on the wicked, those who follow the Antichrist. The wrath of God is not poured out on his saints. Let me just read this verse to you so you don't think that I'm a liar. Revelation 16, verse 1 and 2. I'm explaining a lot to you, and I'm trying to be selective with scriptures for tonight and tomorrow. We'll we'll take a little more of a microscopic view. But Revelation chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, this is the beginning of the pouring out of these bowls. John says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Verse 2, So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men. What type of men? Who did this come upon? Who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So notice again that God's wrath is being poured out, but it's being poured out on those who have rejected him and have bought into the satanic system. The second bowl is then poured out, and it says that the sea and sea creatures are destroyed. This is, sounds familiar, right? It kind of parallels timeline A and timeline B. Then the third bowl is poured out. This will sound familiar as well. The rivers and springs are destroyed. Then the fourth bowl is poured out, and the sun will scorch and torture men. What type of men? Here we go again. The wrath of God's being poured out on the population. What type of men? Revelation 16, verse 9. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So I'm going to say this over and over again during this series. We don't have anything to be afraid of during the final days. The only pressure that we will experience is persecution. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Satan and those who follow him will persecute us, but it's for a season. And it's to have our faith on display in a very dark time. It's to stand witness, to give testimony of what Jesus Christ has done in our life. And yes, many will die for their faith. We have to, we have to try to understand that religious freedom is a historical anomaly. What we've experienced, what I've been able to experience in my lifetime, to have these freedoms and luxuries of owning many Bibles and having big churches and publicly saying who we are, it's truly, if you look at church history, it's a a historical anomaly. It's not usually the story. It's not usually the case. So we can't be shocked when we think of the idea that there will be some sort of persecution up ahead. Like, no, not me. I'm an American Christian. I go to Chick-fil-A, and I go to the Christian bookstore, and there's no way it can happen to me. We are living in a very blessed and unique time, but you go through church history, that is not the case for the majority of Christians. But yes, there will be persecution for a season, and yes, many will die for their faith, but the wicked will experience the absolutely torturous wrath of God. And I would take man's persecution over the wrath of God any day of the week. The fifth bowl is poured out and there's darkness again. There's the parallel again. Sixth bowl, and we have more insight into the Euphrates River again. It will be dried up so that armies can pass through, probably to participate in the Battle of Armageddon. 
Then the seventh bowl is poured out. And what do you think the seventh bowl is? The return of Jesus Christ. These are three separate planes of events that will happen, but it's really one timeline leading to the return of Jesus Christ. Are we heading into trouble sometimes? Yes, we are. But this is what the trouble looks like. As the world turns from the word of God, will first be led by chaos, uh, be led into chaos by stupid men. And that's where we are right now. We're being led by men and women who lack understanding because they rejected the word of God. And that's not to make a personal attack on anyone. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So you remove that, you're not in knowledge, knowledge, you're in ignorance, you're in stupidity. Next, we'll be led by Satan. This increase in apostasy and confusion will open the door for Satan to manifest in our world. But then the trouble will change. Then the trouble will change because after Satan has his time, God will begin to send these plagues upon him and those who have chosen to follow him. And then we who live by faith in the word of God will no longer experience a time of trouble, but the wicked will experience a time of trouble as the wrath of God is being poured out on them. So there's a coming trouble for us, but there's a coming trouble for them or for him. I want you to look at this passage of scripture with me. Paul writes to the church, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 7 through 14, he says, The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Verse 8, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception, among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Verse 11, and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now look at the contrast, verse 13 and 14, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Satan and the ungodly get their brief moment, but eventually the Lord will begin to pour out his wrath on the wicked, and then at his return they will be destroyed. This is what he writes earlier in 2 Thessalonians, real quick, uh, chapter 1, verse 6 through 10. Paul said, it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired <clears throat> among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. When will this be? When will this take place exactly? And how long does Satan and the ungodly get to sort of have their, their way during this time of darkness? And who is this Antichrist going to be? Let's see if we can answer some of these questions. The first two questions can be answered quite easily. When will this begin to happen and how long does Satan and fallen man have to enjoy sort of throwing out the word of God? When will this be? The prophet Daniel wrote of the vision that he saw in the last days where the angel Gabriel revealed to him that the end will actually be a seven-year time period, most, the most notable of that being the last three and a half years. If we look at Daniel chapter 9... We can read the words that were spoken by Gabriel to Daniel. And I'm going to read this out of the NIV for the sake of clarity um, and the amount of time that we have here tonight. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Daniel's receiving a vision very similar to what John saw. And he's told by the angels that 77s, now I'll just tell you again for the sake of time, 
these sevens that are referred to here are, are years, seven years, 70 sets of seven years. And that can be proven, but for the sake of time, you just have to take my word for it and look into it yourself. 70 sets of seven years, or in other words, 490 years in total. He says, are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to bring an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So the angel tells Daniel, he says, Daniel, there are 70 sets of seven years that are remaining for your people in your holy city. The people in the holy city would be the Jews or Israelites, and the holy city would be Jerusalem. After the 70th set of seven years, sin will end. Vision and prophecy will be done, and the most holy place, the temple in Jerusalem, will be purified. In other words, after the final set of seven years, it'll be the end, the end of this age. Now, he goes on to say in verse 25 and 26 what will happen over the course of 69 sets of these seven years, and we're not going to read, read it um, but in it, he says that Jerusalem will, will be rebuilt, that the Messiah will come, that he will die, not for himself, um, but he will be killed. Um, and so, for the sake of others, and what's fascinating is that this is several hundred years before Jesus actually showed up, and yet exactly what the angel told Daniel is exactly what end up, would end up happening. Um, but we don't have time to get into that tonight because I have too many other things to cover. But here's the part of the prophecy that we care, for, care about for tonight. The prophecy of the final set of seven years. The final set of seven years. It says, in that final set of seven years, Daniel 9, verse 27, reading in the same section, it says that he, there's a he, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Everybody say one seven. This is the final set of seven years, which has not happened yet. The first 69 sets of seven years have happened, and you can trace that through biblical history. Jerusalem was rebuilt, the Messiah was cut off, he was killed. Um, there's, there's many other things we could talk about. But the final set of seven years has not happened yet. Reading on, it says, in the middle of the seven, now what's half of seven? Three and a half, that's in the middle. Three and a half years, or 42 months, or 1,260 days. These are all used in, in prophetic terminology. He will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So in the middle, he'll confirm a covenant with many for one set of seven years. In the middle of it, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination. Abomination means something that is absolutely detestable or disgusting to God. Until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now this verse is very important. It's, it's referring to a prince, a ruler. Paul would call him the man of sin or the son of perdition. Gabriel refers to him in verse 26 as the prince who is to come. The apostle John called him the beast in Revelation. And many of us today just refer to him as the Antichrist. The revelation that Daniel receives here tells how the final seven years of this age will go. Gabriel tells him that the final seven years will begin with a, a covenant or an agreement. He will, he will confirm a covenant with many. It says in Daniel 9.27, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, or seven years. The he referred to here is the Antichrist, the man of sin, the lawless one. He will arrange some sort of agreement, most likely political, with many, most likely multiple nations, between multiple nations, and this agreement will start a seven-year time period that will lead to the end. Now, we don't know exactly what this is, and we don't even know who he is at this point, but we'll expound here on some more of his profile. Uh, let's first just finish up this verse in Daniel. So there will be an agreement of some sort with many, but then this will happen. Verse 27, once again, moving on to the part where it says in the middle. In the middle of the seven, in the middle of the seven years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Now, a lot of people believe that this covenant or agreement with many is going to be some sort of peace agreement between the nations of the Middle East 
which will allow Israel to once again worship the way that they did back in the Old Testament. The reason they believe this is because somehow there needs to be a temple in Jerusalem. We're talking about a temple here. And the Jewish people have to be back to sacrificing animals and giving, giving offerings to God again the way they did when they previously owned their land. Because the Antichrist, in the middle of the seven years, is going to bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Well, that has to happen first. It has to begin first. It's almost as if he's going to create this agreement that will give Israel freedom to worship again and to have some sort of ownership in Jerusalem but in the middle of the, the agreement, he will change his mind and force them to stop. That's what it looks like anyways. Some people ask the question right now, are we in the middle of the seven years? Are we in the final seven years? Well, I don't believe so. But I know that we're not in the final three and a half years for sure because there's no temple in Jerusalem right now. In fact, the Jews don't even have sole possession of the land over there. They're co-occupying uh, the land with the Arabs and the, the religion of Islam. But there's no temple and there are no sacrifices happening. If there were to be some sort of agreement made today, allowing them to construct a temple and begin to make animal sacrifices once again, how quickly could it happen that they could step right into that? How quickly could they step right into what they used to, to practice in the Old Testament? The answer is very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. The Jews are already breeding red heifers, which they have to be used, their ashes have to be used to purify the altar of the temple so sacrifices can begin. Those red heifers are already being bred right now. They're already doing practice offerings. I watched one that was done last Passover where they practiced sacrificing a lamb. And they already have most of, if not all of the vessels or furnishings for the temple, already pre-constructed, all set to go. If you go to templeinstitute.org, templeinstitute.org, which is a group that was formed in 1987 and is committed to making the preparations for the temple to be rebuilt, they already have all the furnishings made as we speak. They have a golden candlestick for the temple. They made the Ark of the Covenant already. They have the, all the priest garments. It's all made already. And that's just the stuff that they allow you to see. I wouldn't be surprised if the blocks of the temple are already prepared somewhere as well. Who knows? So this temple and sacrifices could begin very, very quickly. In fact, it would begin right now, except for the fact that if the Jews were to attempt it, there'd be an all-out war between the Jews and the Muslims who occupy that land. But if there's an agreement of some sort that is made, allowing them to be rebuilt, uh, to, to rebuild, then it could happen very, very quickly. So a clear sign of the final seven years would be the Israelite people once again having a temple of worship in Jerusalem. Another clear sign is that in the middle of the seven years, the Antichrist will bring an end to their worship. And then something else will happen. This is very key to knowing where we are in the timeline. Going back one more time to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it says that he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, but in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation, causes scattering, until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. He'll confirm the covenant for seven years. Halfway through, he'll force the Jews to stop their worship. And then... He will set up something in the temple in Jerusalem that is a total abomination to God. And this will cause the area of the temple, Jerusalem, Judea, to become desolate, where the masses will scatter. Now, this event was talked about by Jesus as well, and it was talked about by Paul. Look what they said about it. Jesus said, Matthew 24, 15, he's referring back to this passage we just read. He said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. He says, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, scatter, make the area desolate. Verse 17, let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. 
But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless the days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. He's saying there's going to be a time of great tribulation like you've never seen before. In that area, if you're in that area, run, flee. Don't go back into your house. Leave. Go up into the mountains. Pray that it's not in the wintertime because it's cold in the wintertime. Pray that you're not nursing baby. Why? Because that makes it challenging, another challenge. Pray that it's not on the Sabbath. Why? Because the new institution of the, the Israelite system will be back in place and there's laws against traveling beyond a Sabbath day's journey. The city might be on lockdown. So he's just saying, pray that it's not in a, in a dangerous uh, setting when this happens. Solomon said in the Old Testament, there's nothing new under the sun. But when this happens, this abomination, there will be a time on earth like no man has ever seen. There will be a three and a half year great tribulation. Remember we talked about where, this, where all this turning away from God is going to lead us? Right now we're seeing how dark the world can get when ignorant men lead us, but this great tribulation will be the next step. We'll see what happens, what the world would be like if Satan had more freedom than ever to rule on earth. Paul says this about the abomination moment in the middle of the seven years. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. He says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or word or letter, as if from us, as if the day of Christ had come. It didn't happen. You didn't miss anything. He says, verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means. That day will not come unless there's a falling away first. We've been talking about that. And the man of sin is revealed. That's the abomination of desolation. The son of perdition. Look, he says exactly what he's going to do, verse 4. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is the abomination event that kicks off the three and a half year great tribulation. It looks like this Antichrist, this man of sin, will stop the sacrifices being made in the temple in Jerusalem. And then he will stand in the temple and proclaim that he is actually God thus exposing himself to be the Antichrist. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that next week. But when this happens, we will know what's going on. The eyes of many Jews will be opened and they will know what's going on. They will actually come to know Jesus Christ as a result. But the Antichrist will have approximately three and a half years or 42 months to make war with the saints of God and to give us a glimpse of what it would be like if he was God. Revelation chapter 13 tells us that the world will marvel at him and they will follow him and worship him. Revelation 13, 4 through 8, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Verse 6, then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. That's probably the abomination of desolation. Verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Who is this guy and how is it that the majority of the world is going to follow him? Well, first of all, God is going to give them over to strong delusion because of what's happening right now. People are choosing lies over the truth. Outside of the church, everyone is confused and has thrown the word of God to the curb. And many inside of what are called churches aren't teaching this. They're tickling people's ears, trying to make them happy, trying to make money, and trying to acquire fame. And so because the world already hates the truth, God will help them out by giving them over to strong delusion. And I assure you, the masses will follow this man and his plan. Who is he? 
who is he? Well, he's going to arise. He's going to come to the surface on the wings of peace through the political and religious institutions of the day. Both Daniel and the Apostle John attest to the fact that there will be a political and a religious element to his leadership, that he will rise to the top peacefully, and that he will be deceitfully intriguing to the masses. Daniel says this in Daniel 11. Says, he says he will be a vile person who will come peaceably and seize power by intrigue. He says, after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully. He shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. He shall enter peaceably, even into the richest places of the province. He shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, spoil, and riches, and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. John writes in Revelation of a political aspect and a religious aspect to this time. He says in verse 1 of Revelation 13, he says, I, in his vision, he says, I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. In prophetic literature, to rise up out of the sea means the sea of people. It means rising up out of the population of people. And as we'll dig into more next week, these ten horns that are talked about refer to ten kingdoms or ten united nations. So he arises from the people through politics, through the means of politics. John goes on to write in verse 11, he says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. This is talking about the religious aspect, a false religious aspect to the Antichrist leadership. Horns like a lamb. Who's the lamb of God? Jesus the Christ. Well, this is someone who's like that, but actually speaks under the inspiration of Satan, the dragon. Verse 12 says, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We'll talk some more about this next week. So there is some sort of political and religious system working together to bring about a time of great tribulation here on the earth. I'd love to keep going, but I've gone long enough for tonight. I'm going to stop here and pick up at this spot next week, and we're going to have a more focused uh, study of, of this Portion, but I want to say this before we move to a close. Are we in a time of, of great spiritual darkness as a species? Yes, we are. If we stay on this trajectory, will we head into the final seven years and then the three and a half year great tribulation? Yes, we will. How can I know if we're close to that? A couple things that we looked at tonight. Number one, the building of the temple in Jerusalem. That's a clear indicator. Number two, a political leader who appears to cause the world to be infatuated with him, who will be a friend to Israel, but then turn on Israel. But even before all that, Jesus said there would be signs. There would be birth pains. The beginning of sorrows that will intensify as we approach the great tribulation. Matthew 24, starting at verse 5, he says, Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive. He says, You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He said, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places, food shortages, diseases, natural disasters, wars and whispers of wars, Great spiritual deception in the name of Jesus Christ. But he said in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Guys, these things are happening. These things are happening. I don't think, and, and what do I know? I'm not a prophet. But I don't think we're too far away from prophetic fulfillment. And so what do we do as we approach the hour of darkness? What did Jesus tell us to do as our music team comes? What did he tell us to do? What did Jesus tell us to do about living in these days, living in these trying times? He said in Matthew 26, 41, when he himself was under his own great tribulation, preparing to go to the cross for, for our sins, he said, watch 
and pray. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing to lead you, but the flesh is weak. And by his promise and the apostle John's words that we read in this final exhortation of the book of Revelation, he says this in Revelation 22, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. This is the final prayer request of the, of the entire scriptures of the Bible. The Apostle John saying, even so, Lord, come quickly. The idea is to be looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. All of the seals, all of the trumpets, all of the bowls, all of the antichrist antics and persecutions, as intimidating as they sound, as mysterious as they are, all of this, every timeline that you follow ultimately leads to one thing, one awesome event, the return of Jesus Christ, the revealing that will prove to the entire world that Jesus is Lord, that he is the King of Kings. He is exactly who he claimed to be. Would you stand with me tonight? I know this is a lot of information. We're going to have quite a bit more next week, and we will be talking about other topics in the, in the fourth um, uh, lesson, talking about the resurrection of the, the saints, the rapture of the church, some of those key components as well. But yes, we, there are some troublesome times up ahead for the saints of God. But that brief moment of trouble, it, it'll be nothing in comparison to the trouble that the ungodly will experience when Jesus returns for choosing to reject the truth, for choosing to love the lie. If you don't want to have anything to fear as it pertains to this final chapter, then be sealed by God. Be sealed by God as his property. Now is the time. These things have been laid out in advance so that we know, so that they can be a warning, a, a signal, a, a, an indicator to, uh, to us. Maybe, you know, for, for another term, an idiot light. Wake up. Check engine lights on. Pay attention. Confess your sins to God. Just bring your failures at the, to the feet of Jesus. Repent and confess your sins. Come and be baptized. You want to be water baptized tonight? If you haven't been water baptized... In the name of Jesus, where the name of Jesus is invoked over your vessel, over your being, you can do that tonight. We'll baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. If you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit of God, where God fills you and begins to speak through you in another language, come and pray and ask him to fill you with it. He'll seal you tonight. You can walk out of here having nothing to worry about and begin a whole new journey that leads to eternal life. It's an invitation. These things are warnings for us, but it's the, the main point is to be looking for him, to be looking for him because whether we make it all the way to the end through the, through the final chapter, the final seven years, final three and a half years, or if you die tonight, either way, we're all gonna stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I wanna know him now. I wanna be sealed to him now. I wanna be his, his property today. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for giving us these revelations, giving us these insights that lead to your coming. Lord, we pray, oh God, that you keep us from the hour of, of trial, Lord, that your spirit would be stronger than ever inside of us and inside of this church specifically. Pray, oh God, that we would continue to follow ways of truth, Lord, that we would teach your word unapologetically right to the very end, and that we would be the last ones standing for truth, oh God, even if everyone else turns. Father, help us to continue to cultivate the relationship that you've invited us to, to watch for these things, but to be looking at you, to see these things out of our peripheral vision, Lord, but to be focused completely on your return. In the name of Jesus, I pray that more people would say yes to you as a result of these messages, that they would feel a sense of urgency, that they would say yes to being 
redeemed, to being saved, and to being sealed by your sanctifying power. Bless us and touch us tonight, Lord, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. These prophecies were given to us ahead of time so that we will be watching, so that we will be praying, and the Spirit's reminding us to watch and to pray. And because of that, I think we should take a few moments tonight and do that very thing. And so this area up front is open to you. I invite you to come, to pray, to seek after God, to draw close to Him. If you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, come and pray and ask Him. God will fill you tonight with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't been water baptized with the name of Jesus Christ invoked on your life, come on up here, talk to me after service. We'll make it happen. But come and draw near to the Lord tonight. Let him bless you. Let him bless you. Come up to the front or get alone in a corner and go talk to the Lord. Get down in your pew and, t- and, and turn and face the pew and, and pour your heart, heart out to Jesus Christ. Let him bless you and empower you and seal you with the gift of salvation. In Jesus' name.